welcome to Lacey Township High School, where this afternoon the Lions of Lacey take on the Wildcats of Pylands Regional. Hi, everybody. I'm Rich Steigen, Steigman, along with Ron Everett and George Jack. This afternoon, a huge game in Class B South. All you have to do is take a look at the standings to know the importance of it. Each team 2-0 in Class B South. The winner will take undisputed possession of first place. And around this Pinelands Club, a 4-0 overall, and they have gotten here on the strength of a diverse and powerful rushing attack. Well, the Steve Amato, uh, Jim Vila show has certainly highlighted the shore. Uh, both are 1-2 uh, in the county and 1-5 in the shore as far as the rushing goes. Uh, they scored 19 touchdowns between them. Uh, that highlighted with the, uh, or complemented really by the passing of Joshua Overholt, has really sort of spurred uh, Pinelands on to where they are right now. It's a tremendously big game for them. Uh, Central losing last night, um, Pinelands 4-0, Lacey 2-0 uh, in the conference. This is a game where it'll either be the pressures showing that uh, Pinelands is not quite there, or Pinelands rising to the occasion and winding up to be first place in their conference and getting some extra points toward the state playoff. How big a factor is it for a coach like Bill Bruno and a team that has risen to this level to now have to play a game on the road against a traditional power like Lacey? Do you think they will feel the pressure today? Well, I'm sure there'll be some pressure, but you have to understand that this team has come along, and most of them are three-year starters. Bill Bruno feels as though this is his team now. This is his third year. Uh, he has nothing to prove. He's 4-0 now. He knows that he can win, and people know that he can win. His program is established. But this takes it one step further and one level up. So I think it really is big. Whether the pressure will be a little bit too much, we'll have to wait and see. The Lions have a proud tradition of football here under head coach Lou Versillo. They got off to a very slow start this year, working in some younger guys. They lost their first couple of games, but Lacey now 2-0 in the league, and they feel they've improved every week, George. I think that's the key to this ball game, really. I think Pinelands had a senior team at the beginning of the season. They were expected to do big things. Lacey Township had a key injury, and Brian Elias getting hurt, and they're fighting back, and they're improving every week, and I think it's going to be a better game than a lot of people are predicting. One key thing uh, that you have to give to Lacey is their size. They have an offensive lineman, Chris Campo, who goes about 290 pounds. Keith Bullets plays both ways. He must go anywhere from 240 to 250. Is that something that Lacey needs to exploit today? Oh, I don't think there's any question about the fact that Eddie Heffernan, who's a fine defensive coordinator, one of the finest defensive football coaches in the shore and well-respected, will have his defensive linemen and linebackers ready to stop the run right off the bat. I mean, they're going to try to force... Uh, Pinelands to go to their sophomore quarterback's arm, and uh, that's probably one of the keys to the victory for them. Pinelands has never beaten Lacey in the school's history. The cards are on the table. The battle for first place when we are back right after this. It's election day in Ocean County. Township, Highlands will receive the opening kickoff, and the Wildcats will go from left to right in this first quarter. They're in white, trimmed in green and gold. Lacey is in the navy blue, trimmed in white and red. Sophomore Dunn tees it up at the 40-yard line, kicks it off, and we're underway. This is Ted Brown, who bobbles the kickoff, and now recovers. And Brown does not get it back to the 20-yard line, piled up. Right around the 15-yard line. Pinelands is led by Joshua Overholt, sophomore quarterback. He transferred from Indiana. The teammates call him Indiana Jones, and he has been fearless in leading this team to a 4-0 record. At the top, we mentioned Steve Amato and Jim Vila, the backfield that has 19 touchdowns combined. Ted Brown, the starting split end. Big Joe Kochik at 220 pounds, the starting flanker. Matt Hatcher is the tight end. Offensive line from left to right is Mike Foy, Russ Salento, Mike Davis, one of the captains, Corey Matter in the right guard and Joe Princiati the right tackle. It is a first and 10 at the 15 yard line. And Pylon starts on the ground and that is Jim Vila the fullback and he picked up about two or three. Defensively, we'll see some different looks from the Lions. The front four, Matt Coffey, Eric Jacobson, John Campagna and Keith Bullets. He's one of the guys to watch, number 77. Linebackers Tom Nolan, Dave Lobdell and Dave Cottrell. The corners in the secondary are John Cohn and Jordan Burton, Tom Altman, and Mike Kilmurray, the safeties. Kilmurray also one of the better defensive players back there. Second down and eight at the 17-yard line, and this time the Wildcats work from the eye. 
and here's the first carry for Steve Amato, and again did not get much. Altman making the tackle after a two-yard gain. At least he's in a 4-3 defense right now. Four down linemen, three linebackers, and down the field, they're in that uh, umbrella. On offense, uh, Pineland started out in a, a strong formation and ran away from the formation, trying to catch Lacey off guard, running away from their strength. And then that last time they came out in two tight ends and a flanker and ran what has gotten them this far off tackle with Steve Amato carrying the ball with no gain. You just got to look at Ed Heffernan, the defensive coordinator for the Lions, and he's considered one of the best uh, in the shore at uh, coming up with defensive game plans. Draw on third and six, and Amato has a first down. Outside the 30, he is wrestled down. Highlands going to a draw on third and six, and it works for the first down. Okay, on the replay, you can see the quarterback show pass. Ball's given to Amato, a real great run, breaks to the outside and gets the first down. The Lions on it, at least to the first couple of plays, force Pylons into that passing situation, and you thought perhaps they would force the sophomore to put it up, but the draw works. First down now at the Wildcats, 31. Two tight ends set, and here's Amato looking to get wide, but he won't do it. Dave Cottrell, who is the leading rusher on this team, makes the play. I think in a game like this, you're going to find that the uh, the four opponents that were played uh, were opponents to Pinelands in the first four weeks were not quite up to par defensively and maybe not offensively to the uh, Lacey team. I think it's it's something that they've got to adjust to. It's a little bit harder hitting. The defense is a little bit more and maybe better schooled. So I think you're going to see maybe some adjustments done offensively by Pinelands. Second down and nine on about the 32. Kocek is to the right and Ted Brown to the left and Overholt looking to throw and does and it is complete on the far sideline. That is uh, Ted Brown, and he is short of a first down by about three. That ball was hanging in the air a little bit, and uh, had the defender for Lacey been a little quicker, there may have been a pickoff. Overholt has only thrown one interception all season, so they haven't put too much on the sophomore quarterback, but what they've asked him to do, he's done well. I was gonna say, and Ron knows better than I did, throwing to the left is always tough for a right-handed quarterback. And I think the uh, the whole approach, coaching approach of Bill Bruno, not to put too much on the shoulders of his quarterback is good also. Another uh, third down play. It is third down about three. Highlands at its own 38. First possession of the ball game on the option run up the middle and room for Jim Vila and the fullback brings it down to the 48 yard line and another High Lance first down. You got to worry. You got to look at Lou Brasillo wearing that. Uh, Notre Dame cap that has become his emblem here. In fact, a little Notre Dame feel around here. We heard the Notre Dame fight song as the Lions took the field. Brasil has been around a long time and considered certainly one of the finest coaches and more than that in the Shore area. Well, Lou is the kind of a person who's good for the game of football, Rich. He runs a lot of clinics. He's always involved in other things besides just coaching his own team. Three minutes gone by the first quarter. First down at the Wildcats 48. They'll run this from the eye. Here's a model of the tailback. Hit at the line of scrimmage and piled up. Right now, uh, the bread and butter plays out of the eye formation by uh, Pinelands. It, it's, it's effective, but it's also winding them up into second and third and long situations, which means they've got to go to plays like the draw, the screen, which we haven't seen yet, but I'm sure they have in their package, and, and the pass off of, uh, uh, of the sprint to put pressure on the corner. Uh, right now it'll be interesting. It's second and long. It's, it's ideal for the defense. It's a tough down for the offense. Overholt has thrown once on the drive, and that was completed to Ted Brown, who's not in the game. He's replaced by his twin brother, Colin, who flanks to the right. Two tight ends in the game, and play action. Overholt keeping it. Has five and goes out of bounds. Close to another Pylons first down. Bill Bruno's offense does a very nice job of mixing it up, as you mentioned. I think Joshua Overholt is a, is, is a little bit faster than people give him credit for. Uh, he makes that fake up inside, which of course keeps those corners and those defensive ends in tight, and then pops it to the outside and showed good speed. That was Bill it. Bruno, the head coach, in the uh, white t-shirt and the green shorts toward the right of your screen. He has turned this program around, been very successful, and Sean Lutoff, the offensive coordinator, helping him out with the, the play calling and diversity, working on his opening drive. That was an excellent fake by the young quarterback, Johnny Campagna, who's a steady defensive lineman for Lacey, was fooled completely. Third down and short into Lacey territory at the 43-yard line. They shift around again in the backfield. And here is Amato. He appears to have the first down again. 
down to the line 40, and it is a first down, the third of the drive for the Wildcats. George, when you're talking to uh, Lou, did he mention something about the, the sizes? I, I think he may have been concerned about whether the sizes of, of Pinelands was going to give him a problem because he knows he's big. Yeah, and uh, not, not only that, but uh, he, was, he was very concerned about the quick traps up the middle, which have hurt him. And we have seen a lot of two tight end set from the Wildcats as we do on this play. First and 10, right up the middle. There goes Vila, and Jim Vila, the junior running back, picks up a couple. I think you're going to see some two tight end from both teams because what that does, it dictates to the defense that you have to play a straight defense. You can't overshift from one side to the other because you have blocking potential with the tight end to either side. So what Highlands is trying to do is tell Lacey what defense to play. Down below us, the uh, crowd has broken into its first war chant of the afternoon. And if you uh, watch any of the World Series games in Atlanta last week, you are more than familiar with this tune. Second down and eight, Overholt has it, firing, and it is complete for Vila. And Vila down the sideline, out of bounds, about a yard shy of the first. That time they sent uh, Jim Vila through the line of scrimmage. Quarterback came to this side, popped the ball, he was wide open. Steve Amato is a guy that may have gotten a little more publicity coming into the season, but what a job. While the Wildcats have gotten from Vila, 52 carries, 385 yards rushing coming in among the uh, short conference leaders, averaging just under seven and a half yards a carry. That's a pretty good reason why Pinelands is ranked number one in the county with uh, over 1,200, almost 1,300 yards total offense. A ball control drive being engineered here by the Wildcats. Another third in play. Here's third and about two at the 32. Here's Amato cutting it back, and he breaks the tackle for the first down, and Kilmurray had to use all of his strength to wrestle him down there. I think uh, in talking with both coaches, uh, it was pretty much a recognized fact that both Amato and Vila were slash and bounce to the outside runners. Now that time, he hit up inside and cut back, and if you're not prepared for that, that could be a definite problem. If you don't have his lineman sliding down and that back uh, linebacker making sure that he checks his gap first, it could create a problem. That time, the cutback almost broke it for a touchdown. Now a first down at the 24-yard line. No one in Ocean County's picked up more first downs this season than Pinelands, picking up right where they've left off in each of the past four weeks. Vila for about three, stopped. I think right now, Pinelands is proving to a lot of people that they can play with the best of the shore. Right now, they're running at a big season, the well-schooled defense, and they're gaining yards. And I think right now, it, it really shows the preparation of Coach Bruno and his staff, and of course, the readiness that their players show. Now, Lacey's gone to a five-man line to try and stop this running game. We are more than halfway through this first period. This is the first drive of the football game. This is something that we've seen the Wildcats do before. They did it against Manchester driving like this. Second and seven. Penalty flag is down. Breaking a tackle on the far side's Amato. Another good run, but this one may be coming back. That was good second effort running. I think both backs displayed that for the first four uh, weeks of the season and are continuing that uh, to exhibit that. That's, that's an excellent quality. Not only the ability to hit and bounce outside, but also to run through that first uh, tackler. I didn't get a signal, but I see they are backing the ball up, so the penalty is against Pinelands. And Ed Heffernan was over on the Lacey Silent indicating, of course, that the Lions wanted to take the penalty, and it'll be stepped off from the 20 and spotted down. It was an illegal motion call. That's a five-yard penalty to move it back to about the uh, Lacey 25. There have been a lot of statistics made about people in high school being able to drive the football without making a mistake. Very rare, very rarely does a high school football team without a mistake drive the length of the field. And that was a mistake and a costly mistake for Pinelands at this point. Now they're faced with second down and long. Pinelands has it at Lacey's 25-yard line, second and 12. Quick pitch, Amato may throw it. He does, down the field for Ted Brown, touchdown! Well done, that was well done. Nice fake, tucked the ball away like he was gonna run with it, pulled himself up and laid it out to a man wide open. I think he picked a great time to call that play, I really do. He, he uh, the, the coaching staff realized the, the defense that they were going to be in, being in a long, first and long yardage situation. It was a great call, great throw and a great catch. 
we spoke to Bill Bruno during the week, and I said, anything special you put in for a big game like this, a better defense? He said, oh, no, no, we're just going to run our, our basic plays. That's how we succeed. And it's a fake extra point. Overhaul throwing for Kocek. He slides and has it. Two more. Bill Bruno pulls out all the stops on the first drive. Halfback option for six. Fake point after for two. And here is a look at that touchdown play. Okay, here's the pitch out. Making it look like run. Vila throwing the football. Brown making the reception. As I said, great call and great execution. And how about right off the bat, five and a half minutes to go first quarter, you've had a beautiful drive and scored, and you have a, a fairly reliable kicker in Fawcett about to make it 7-0. Well, let's uh, take another stab at it. Well, you know, I would have to check back in the statistics and what they've tried to do on extra points, but I would venture to say very seldom this early in the game has Pinelands gone for two points. And against a team like Lacey, sometimes you have to take that extra chance because you never know. It may be a while before you get in the end zone again. Maybe not, maybe yes, but get the points while you can get them. Yeah, and philosophy-wise, you're going to let the other team know that we're coming after you right away. Kochik with his best uh, Kirby Puckett in imitation there. The uh, puck slide right down to come up with it in two more. Kick, uh, I don't think what Steve Amato had in mind there, but a penalty flag was down. And that could turn out to be a break for Pinelands because now they'll get to kick it again from the Wildcat 35. Uh, Amato really squibbed it off the side of his foot. Perhaps he stumbled before kicking it because Pinelands was offside. So Rich Barklowski and his offensive unit will uh, get the ball already down eight points with five to go in the first quarter for its first snap. That was a nice, nice drive, but the game is far from over, and Lacey has to get the ball now and move it down the field and establish their own offense. 5.26 on the clock, first quarter. And Amato has re it back at the 35-yard line. No one deeper than the 20-yard line for the Lions. And again, an off-balance kick heading to the near sideline and out of bounds. And Lacey is going to be looking at very good field position when this process ends. Guys, I'm curious to see how the Lions uh, do react very early in the game. But I thought in their first couple of losses, they played very tough teams. No question about that. And Lou Brasillo acknowledged that they may have been the two toughest teams on their schedule, Brick Memorial and then North. But I felt that Lacey got down on itself a little bit. Such high expectations. And now I, I think a lot of people still figured perhaps they're a better team. The tradition is here to beat Pinelands. They get down a couple of scores. I'm curious to see how the club reacts. Well, you know, their last couple of ball games, even the, including the loss to North, uh, their coaching staff thought they played very, very hard. Not the case against Brick Memorial, their first game. Of course, they scored a lot of points against Wall. Uh, showed they can put the ball in the end zone. So uh, I think you're going to see a Lacey team that is going to start out spreading people out, trying to establish the run. If the pass is there, they'll take the pass. But I think you'll see them try to use that big, strong up front to, to move the ball up the field. Jordan Burton is the deep man for Lacey, and I use the term advisedly. He is standing at his own 20-yard line. Third time, uh, not really a charm for Amato as that one rolls to the far sideline. And again, out of bounds at around the Lacey 41. This is becoming a disturbing trend if you're a, a Pinelands coach right here. What's going on out there? Well, I think he just missed the ball. I mean, he's not trying to kick it. It doesn't look like he's trying to kick it out of bounds or onside. He's just missing the football. You know, it's, it's a little bit different when you're in amongst 22 people and you, you make a mistake, you can't see it. But here you are, the kicker, and you've now squibbed it three different times, and it's not supposed to be a squib kick. It, it, it can get to you a little bit as a youngster. That is probably Steve Amato's first touchdown pass of his career. Perhaps the excitement has gotten to him. Although he looks like he is trying to keep it low and on the ground, but it, at least he wants to keep it if not down the center of the field, on the field of play. He's keeping it low and on the ground. It's on the 25-yard line. One more time, in the air, and this will be returned. And nearly a collision, but now here is Burton going out from right to left, and Burton bringing it nearly out to midfield. And another penalty flag is down on the far side of the field at around the Pinelands 37-yard line. Georgia looked to me like up, right up inside, right up the middle. 
looked like yeah. there was a heck of a crease, but I guess he was instructed to come to the sideline. Well, I don't know, but he, I, I thought the same thing. I saw a lot of air up the middle of the field. His teammates have done a nice job blocking, especially when you catch the ball on one side of the field. Try not to run all the way over to the other side of the field. This penalty is against Lacey. It's a holding penalty, and that will back the Lions up a little bit when Rich Barkowski, the junior quarterback, finally takes his first step. Dave Cottrell, a senior running back who has played very well at the fullback spot, and Gary Sasala joined him in the backfield. Sasala, the sophomore, went over 100 yards last week. Mike Kilmurray and Jeff Brewer, the wide receivers. Jason King is the tight end, and here come the Lions. Lacey starts at its own 38 first down. That is Kilmurray wide out to the right, and the back's in the I formation. This is Sasala. Penalty flag is down. Sasala had a good surge, picked up about four, but that's going to come back. Yeah, linemen were not set, and as the ball was snapped, one of the linemen for Lacey got set, and it's a penalty. That was a big problem for Lacey, and it's first uh, two losses of the season. A lot of offside, illegal motion on both sides of the ball. The offensive line, Matt Coffey, Dave Lobdell, Keith Bullets, the center, Eric Jacobson, and big Chris Campo, number 75. He goes 290 pounds. Defensively, Pylons group very aggressive and some good speed. Front five of Matt Hatcher, Joe Princiati, Mike Foy on the nose. He'll be matched against Bullets. Joe Kochik, who's a wide receiver and caught that two-point conversion. He's a tackle on defense. And Corey Mattern up front. Mike Davis, Brian Nuss, Steve Amato. You call Amato a, a linebacker. He's, he's kind of a rover back there. Ted and Colin Brown, the twins in the secondary, along with Todd Walsh. Here's a first and 15 now. Back at the 33-yard line. And again! This has become a penalty flag festival these past couple of minutes here. You know, the first time that uh, Lacey had the ball, when they had their first penalty, uh, the, the offensive line came off a little early, but they did come off the ball, and I think that's that's not bad. It's, it's bad if you keep getting penalties, but at least they're into the game, and they know that the snap count, they've got to get off and get into the defense. It'll be interesting to see whether or not maybe that nervousness we talked about pregame may be in the helmets of the Lacey team and not the helmets of the Pineland players. Well, guys, by my unofficial count, that is six straight plays on which we've seen a penalty. So and they were there. They were there also. We need to lower the goals a little bit and see if we can just get one off here without a flag. First and 20 on the draw. Sasala pulled down at about the 32-yard line, and Lacey's still looking at a second down and long. Right now, with the uh, tight end wing set that Lacey has, it sort of dictates a very, very straight kind of defense from, uh, from Pinelands, and that's what... Uh, Lou Brasillo wanted to create during the week uh, rather than give them an opportunity to overload on one side or another. He's trying to balance things out. Pineland's defense right now is certainly rising to the occasion. They're playing very, very tough. Sasala so leaves this time and Cottrell is a single setback and we get two wide receivers with Brewer out to the right. And here is Cottrell. Has room down the sideline and Cottrell out of bounds outside the 40. And it will be a third down upcoming for Lacey. Dave Cottrell is uh, one of the leading rushers uh, in the county as well. In fact, he ranks right underneath uh, Jim Villa. Uh, he's uh, rushed the ball 61 times for uh, over 350 yards. He's averaging almost six yards a carry. Finally, is starting to shade their defensive tackles to the inside eye of the tackles. And the Lacey tackles got an angle on him that time. Line of scrimmage, the line 44. It is a third down and about four. Two tight ends. And here is the uh, single setback. Cottrell making a nice move and diving out. He's close to first down yardage. We may need a measurement. Short. Short, Rich. I think what they may be doing a little bit too, George, is they may be doing a little check with me on the nose guard. Nose guard starts to go uh, and shade one side or the other. They'll run that dive away from the shade and let their big center, Keith Bullets, just take that nose guard where he wants and run the dive up inside. That's what they did last play. So when you talk about a, a check with me then, you're just going to give the ball to Cottrell and he'll read the key which way the block goes and go the other way? No, what you do is you have a play that's designed to go to either side of the center and you as the, the quarterback, as you approach the line of scrimmage, see where that nose guard is playing and you call the play, an okay. audible on the play to the other side of the uh, center. Well, already a huge play in this game in the first quarter. Fourth and less than a yard, just shy of the pylons, lens, 48. Cottrell has it. Nice job by the offensive line and Dave Cottrell got out to about midfield. We have 
3.15 to go, first quarter. Lacey on its first possession of the game. On the opening kickoff, Pylands took it, controlled the ball for over six minutes, and then on a halfback option, a motto to Ted Brown for a touchdown and off a fake conversion, they picked up two more. Now a first down for Lacey Ball, resting right at the midfield stripe. Sasala back in the game, and here he is. Sasala running to his left, broke about two tackles, and got about four yards. Mike Davis stepped up from his linebacker position, but couldn't finish him off. Yeah, that Mike time, I'm sorry, Drew, that time we had one heck of a mismatch. Uh, Russ Salento on defense, number 69, at 5'10", 165, was just blocked completely out of the picture by uh, big Chris Campo at uh, 6'4", 285 pounds. And if you can create those mismatches, you're going to get that yardage up inside. Could not be any better weather for football. And we've had a, a very mild October, especially on Saturday afternoons. And crowd is well filled in down below us on the home sideline and also a Tremendous crowd of supporters coming up from Pinelands today on the far sideline. Here's Sasala with a huge hole, and Gary Sasala has a first down and more. That was the old counter trade that you see the Washington Redskins developed three or four years ago where they pull the offside lineman, and then he'll come back and they'll lead the play. Found a nice hole in there. Nice trap by the lead tackle. I tell you what they create on that too, George. They create great blocking angles by the onside. And that time again, that mismatch, Campo just crushed Salento. Brian Nuss made the saving tackle down at the Wildcat 23-yard line. So the Lions offense answering back so far. Two wide receivers set with 82, John Cohen flanked out to the right and Kill Murray on the left. Barglowski kept it. And I suppose that was a design run, but he had uh, nowhere to go and stopped at the line of scrimmage. Brian Nuss made a nice play for Pinelands that time. He sort of sneaked in behind those big linemen and made that tackle in the backfield. Lacey likes to shuffle its uh, personnel around, too, getting the plays in from the sidelines in Lou Versillo. Dave Lobdell just came back in the game. Now Sasala heads to the sideline. Well, they're going to a single back offense, Rich. So they sent the receiver in for a running back. Second down and about nine as Barglowski looks it over. Keep it on the ground, and here is Cottrell. Strong running by the uh, senior back. He's just 5'10", 180 pounds, and I don't think we have seen a play yet where Cottrell has gone down uh, on the first hit. He's a hard running kid. I tell you, the line of scrimmage is being completely neutralized by the offensive line of Lacey. There is absolutely no penetration by Pinelands it is a gap control defense, granted, but there is absolutely no penetration. Everything is on the Pineland side of the line of scrimmage, and there's always positive yards. This could be the final play of the first quarter, and now uh, officials have called timeout. The Lions are looking at a third down and three at the 16. Clock restarts down to 22 seconds to go in the period. Eight nothing Pylons. In motion goes Brewer across your screen. And there goes Cottrell with Brewer blocking, and Cottrell dives out and has a first down. It should bring up a first and goal at about the 10 yard line. Yeah. You know, uh, Pinelands jumped both linebackers into the line of scrimmage that time. The ball went away from them, so they couldn't scrape to the area of attack. I feel like I'm watching a Giants game. Pinelands got the ball, went 85 yards in over six and a half minutes. The Wildcats took an eight-nothing lead, but keeping it on the ground, on the ground rather, Lacey's offense has brought it right back, and now they break huddle. The uh, clock down to our right says no more time is left, and that appears to be the case. We are one quarter complete from Lacey Township. Lots of running, lots of yards gained, only two possessions. After one quarter, it's Pylons eight, Lacey nothing. We're back with second quarter action right after this.
George Jack back at Lacey Township. A first quarter that had defensive coordinators scratching their heads. 8-0 Pylons. Lacey has moved it down as they go from left to right in the second quarter. The Lions will have a first and goal from the Pylons 10. I think you've got to give, uh, there you see Lubricillo running off the field after giving instructions to his, uh, his offensive unit. Wings set with Cottrell in the backfield. Brewer goes in motion. Cottrell takes the carry, cuts it back, and only got a couple. Right now what's happening is that the offside the, uh, side of the defensive line is starting to come down. Uh, it's creating some cutback lanes, which you saw Cottrell try to do, but it also shows that the defense is starting to get wary that when they run to one side, that's what the, they've got to do. They've got to come down and prevent the cutback. And they've got to pursue, and they've got to really swarm to the football. Jeff Brewer went in motion that time, and I thought uh, Mike Kilmeri had a lot of air in the corner over here, the wide side of the field. This time it is Tom Nolan coming out to the right, and he is one-on-one -on -one out there with uh, Ted Brown, second and goal, at about the eight, out of the eye. Quick pitch, Sasala with Cottrell leading, and he is piled up, and a penalty flag comes down, and normally that uh, would be a, an illegal block of some sort against the offense. I, I saw an awful lot of white shirts, though. I don't know, maybe an inadvertent face mask or something like that. Usually it is against the offense, though. It's like holding to me, Rich. And it, it, it is a hold against Lacey, and that's a, a critical penalty in the, as uh, all football analysts like to say, in the red zone. You don't want to get backed up. Yeah, well, uh, different coaches call it different things, you know. We used to call it smell the paint zone. <laughs> the red zone has become the uh, catchphrase of the 90s for football. Now, all of a sudden, one guy said it, and it, and it worked. So everyone's talking about scoring in the red zone. That's the way you win football well, games. Well, most coaches break the field down into different zones. So when you call it the red zone, it's usually four down territory is what you mean. In a game where there's so much running, is it that different defensively? It's one thing if you're throwing the ball up and down the field, but here... Uh, defenses have to be reading run anyhow, and we'll get to that after this play. Second out of goal, Barglowski will throw it. Maybe not. Looks to cut it back. Now he does throw. Brewer touchdown. But a penalty flag is down. It's coming back. Barglowski went past the line of scrimmage, and we're going to be able to get a replay of that and let you know. It looked like he did do that, though. It looked like he had an indecision in his mind. Shall I keep it? Shall I throw it? I think we have a replay. Try to watch the line of scrimmage. It's yeah, about here you the see the quarterback roll. Line. Now you see a, a wide open field. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know who made that call. The referee or the headline. Well, I tell you what, the I'll ball was what. thrown. And that front foot did come down after the ball was thrown on the line of scrimmage. Uh, from up here, I think if there was a replay, uh, Coach Vasilla would have a little uh, bone to pick with the officials. Yeah, I, I thought the ball so was too. gone. I thought the ball was gone. I think taking a look at that replay, the line of scrimmage was the 15, maybe even a little bit inside that. In fact, with a five-yard penalty, I'd like to get another look at that. Maybe uh, we can get that again. Watch where the ball is. It starts from inside the 15. Watch where his left foot. He throws off his right foot. Okay, his left foot comes down, but after the ball is thrown. Uh, that was awful tight. So a huge call in this game. Lacey loses a touchdown on a questionable penalty. Now it's a loss of down. Third and goal at the 19, Barglowski setting up this time in major trouble, dumps it off, but that is not an eligible receiver. He saw Matt Coffey, but he was no outlet, and that could be intentional grounding. But I don't see a flag on that play. Barglowski a little slow to get up, and now a penalty flag does come down. I think the officials had to sort out whether or not that was an eligible receiver. What a wild sequence. Lacey had a touchdown that it deserved on a beautiful play. Barglowski held it and found Brewer in the end zone. But the officials ruled that Barglowski went past the line of scrimmage, and now Lacey will be backed up further as an intentional grounding is going to be called. And uh, this could wind up being just a long drive, uh, nothing will come of it. I think it's a loss of down, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> the officials marking it off, and it is all the way back. How about this? They are all the way back at the Pylons 33 yard line. This started as a first and goal of the 10, and now the line's looking at fourth and goal, and they might not be able to punt the ball through the uprights if they try. I tell you, it's a shame because I, I would be the last to tell an official how to call a game. Um, but it, unless it's a definite, 
uh, very obvious in a situation like that where he is two or three or four yards over the line of scrimmage. I don't know. It's very difficult to call. Ed Heffernan not too thrilled. Well, the official's right on the line of scrimmage, though, and now Lacey will call timeout, but I want to get back to something you said. The official is right on the line of scrimmage. If, in his opinion, he thinks the guy was just a foot or, or two absolutely. feet over. Absolutely. He have to call it? Sure, absolutely. He, and he is in his, his, his total uh, correctness to do that. Um, I, I think uh, in, a, in any judgment call where in his judgment he is over, he has to call it the way he sees it. He's the official. He's wearing the, the uniform, and, and it's his responsibility. So in his mind, obviously, that was correct. They are uh, doing yeoman's work in the truck, and they have another look at the controversial play. I want to see who calls the, the penalty, the referee behind the play or the head linesman who's looking right down the line. I thought it was the official who was right on the line, but we're going to get a look at the freeze. Remember, the line of scrimmage is the 15-yard line, and the ball is gone there. And his foot is not yet at the 15. His okay, arm the ball is gone, exactly. Uh, in, I, fact, I, in fact, the, uh, the the line of scrimmage is like the, the 14 and a half yard line. It's not really on the line. Hallelujah. Great work by Jeff Simons, Chris Arrania down in our truck, bringing us a look at that play. And it will not comfort Lions fans, Eddie, or the Lions coaching staff when they do get a look at that replay. They're not going to be happy about that, I can guarantee you. Well, here's where you go to the back of the playbook. Huh? It is fourth and goal at, at the 33. And following the timeout, the Lions come out of the huddle. We're going to send Kilmary long. Just throw it up there for him. Well, Barglowski's looking out that way. George Jack called it. Barglowski one on two. Touchdown! <laughs> Sometimes it's the simple things that count. You get ready with a game plan, you work all week, and when it comes right down to you say everybody out for a long one and you get six. <laughs> I tell you, the, you know, they lined up, they had single coverage on their best receiver. He fades to the outside into the corner of the end zone. They bring the safety over, they bring the linebacker over. It was a three on one. It was a great throw and a great judgment of the ball in the air by Kilmurray. He did make a great adjustment. I'm sure we'll get a look at that as he faded uh, to the corner to pull it in. Now Lacey trailing at 8-6, goes for two. Barglowski on the roll, looking for control. We're tied! <laughs> we will take a look at Barglowski's touchdown pass to Mike Kilmurray. Your basic fourth and goal the, to 33. Uh, throw. Just hangs it up. Goes it as far as he can into the corner. Great judgment and a great catch. Defensive people were right around him. Good coverage. We have 10 minutes, 31 seconds to go in the first half. Lacey and Pilots play for first place in Class B South League. And to this point, it has certainly lived up to all expectations. Oh, it's a great game. It's a great game. You've got two possessions. Possession by each club. Both have scored. Both have gone for two. Both have scored. We're now 8-8. Great ball game. Hey, they scored. And what did they score on? A halfback option on second and long. And a, and a bomb into double coverage on fourth and goal outside the 30. And then uh, just the icing on the cake so far as the two-point conversion. And you know, both way. of the scoring plays are very uncharacteristic because they're both yep. ground-oriented football teams. But they have shown they can move the ball on the ground and they can throw. It should be as interesting from here on in. Lacey kicks off, and this one definitely staying in bounds for the Lions. And here's uh, Ted Brown back at his five-yard line. Good moves by Brown, who stays on his feet. And brought it outside the 30-yard line. Teddy Brown, nice job. He's a young man that caught the option pass in the first quarter for the touchdown. We can get a look at the move that Ted made there. He's not a running back either. I mean, he makes a move to the center, draws everybody in, and then he cuts to the sidelines. I don't know if he did it intentionally, but that's the way to move. Second possession now for the Wildcats. Josh Overholt at the helm. He went uh, one for one and then completed another out of a uh, placement formation. And he looks to throw on first down here. Instead, he'll keep it. And he's forced out of bounds after a, a couple of yards. Then Joe Kochik laid a late block out there on one of the lines. That 
waggle action that you just saw is their fist passing play. That and the pass off of the hard off tackle run by Steve Amato, those two running plays and the passes off them have given their opponents the most problems, and that's what the Lacey staff was most wary of right now. There you saw the waggle. Quarterback decided to keep the ball, but he did have people open. You get the feeling Overholt does think run first when he gets out there. Second down and eight of the 33 from the eye. Here is Vila. Vila with a block. Moved it down to about the 38. Highlands playing its uh, possession type game. Gets a third and short. I think the offensive line coaches on, on both sides of the field deserve a pat in the back because they've obviously developed some blocking schemes and have instilled in their football players, hey, get into the defense, create some running lanes because we both have backs. Both Lacey and Pineland have backs that if you get them a little crack, they're going to get some yards for you. And it seems like both uh, teams' backs enjoy the same kind of style, that cut back, not incredibly strong, not incredibly fast, but great instincts and, and an ability to find the hole. It is a third down play here, third and three. Amato with a penalty flag down, picked up a first down. Again, it may come back. He moved it out to the Wildcat 45, but we will await the call. It looked like Matty Hatcher grabbed the linebacker's legs, the uh, number 87. George Jack on the ball again, and he's like holding I don't know. I mean, it looked like it. <laughs> you I got the you, right uh, call. We will give you the benefit of the doubt on the player ID. How's that? It appeared to me that uh, Steve Amato may have gotten a, a little uh, nick that time, uh, thigh injury or something of that nature, because uh, he's, he's coming out of the football game, and uh, I just wonder where he'll go from here. Amato is, Kochik has left as well. Kochik is over on the Pineland sidelines. And let's see if we can pick out Amato. Well, Amato's still in the game. I think it was Coach limping. Yeah, he is limping. And Kochek uh, left. So Amato the tailback here, Vila the up back. Now it's a third and 13 play. And they do uh, fake the draw. Now Overholt firing one to the far side. Picked off Kill Murray. Inside the Wildcat, or inside the Wildcat 40 yard line. Overholt hung it up there, and Kill Murray comes up with it. I really don't think that the long passing game is Joshua Overholt's forte. I think he's more a pass short off action. Sometimes it hangs up there. And I tell you, Lacey's defensive backs, as Pinelands are, very experienced, and they move to the ball well. I thought he was going to come back with the draw again, but he faked the draw and went for the long bomb at 8-8. Eight, eight, I don't know, you know? I'm not going to second guess Coach Bruno because he's doing a great job. But I probably would have run the draw and then maybe punt and put them on their backs. Mike Kilmurray has got to be one of the top athletes and students on this Lacey team. A senior, 6'2", plays both sides of the ball, also an excellent basketball player uh, among the leaders in his class as a senior. He comes out to the right side here. Lacey after the turnover. A first down to the 38. Sasala tripped up in the backfield. Nice play by Jim Vila, who does not start defensively, but he made that hit. Both of these teams love to play fake off tackle and run their backs to the flat, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that, and that's one of the plays that I think they both have to stop on each other. Well, you know, they both have established the run, and, and as, as you and I both know, George, once you do that, the passing game just as naturally follows, and both teams know they can run the football, and their opponents know that, so the pass game off of that should be very effective. Eight minutes to go, first half, 8-8 eight, eight the score. Second down on 12 at the 39-yard line. Slot right, Sasala behind Cottrell, down the sideline, on his feet, first down inside the 25. He has really improved since I saw them uh, the first ball game of the year against Brick Memorial. This kid has really improved in leaps and bounds, Sasala. Gary Sasala is a black belt in karate. So they, they weren't afraid that he'd be a, afraid to mix it up out there, but they said he was a little tentative in running first couple of games, and then I think it was 124 yards last week, his breakthrough game. You know what I think probably happened in preseason? Uh, you know, the, the other back, of course, got all the work, and of course, Brian Elias gets hurt, and boom, now you're into the first game with your backup. So it takes him a little while. This is a first down and 10 from the Pylons, 25. Setting up the pass, short to Cottrell, has it to the 20, and drag out of bounds.
Mark Glosky has beautiful form, doesn't he, as a quarterback? I tell you, he's going to be a good quarterback. Uh, I know when we watched him against Brick Memorial, he made some very, very beginning game and, and young quarterback mistakes. But right now, he's throwing the ball with a quarterback who has had four weeks of experience behind him. And as a junior, he's got a ton of potential. And I think you're going to see him improve even more as the season progresses. Of course, he's in a position here where he's replacing the guy who was the best player in the county last year, Garrett Gordy, who is now up at Cornell. Got to be the expectations on this club. After all, Elias and up there in the nation leaders of Princeton and Gordy, they're gone. And now it's this, uh, this group of guys that will decide their fate on second down. Here is Sasala running for another Lions first down. Colin Brown stopped him at the 10. You know, I can't think of anything better for Rich Barglowski than to have played behind Garrett Gardy because when you play behind a kid like that and you watch him and you learn from him, you're going to develop into the same type of a quarterback, hopefully. Garrett's doing real well, by the way, in college. His dad said he's playing defense. He loves it. First down and goal. This is where all the trouble started for Lacey last time when they had a first and goal at the 10. Sasala, again, the second back through, got about three. What are you thinking right now if you're Glenn DeMarie, the defensive coordinator for Pylons? What's, what's the adjustment to make? Well, I think what you've got to understand is that every team has certain goal line plays, but they don't change a whole lot from what have gotten you there, what you've done the first four. So I think the, the lead is what he wants to try to contain off tackle, and he wants to try to make sure that when they hit up inside, they're incapable of bouncing out, which the, the Lacey backs seem to do very well. So I think right now he's telling his people, hey, make sure you control the gaps, squeeze things, but make sure our backers and our defensive ends don't commit too much to prevent the bang outside. 82, John Cohen, a wing back on this play, and a trip up in the backfield is Dave Cottrell. Good play by yeah. Corey Matter. That's the second time they went to that split end and went to the wing right and ran to the wing. Matter, one of the best defensive linemen on this team. He does not have great size either. Pilots, not an overly big team, certainly. Matter at just 180. He's been in the backfield a couple of times today. And, you know, I mentioned uh, when we when we had the uh, uh, Pinelands game against uh, Manchester that uh, Corey's brother, uh, Greg, played for Pinelands in their conference championship team a few years ago. He's at the University of Massachusetts right now. But uh, you're talking about Greg, who's about 215 or 220, and uh, Corey's about 180, but he's just as tenacious, just as tough. And, uh, and an excellent football player. Lacey has used its second time out. We have six minutes, 11 seconds to go in what has been a quick pace and exciting first half. Lacey and Pylons tied at eight, and it has been a different group of younger players that this Lacey coaching staff has had the pleasure of dealing with this year. Yeah, why don't we go over the coaching staff for Lacey while we have a moment. Uh, Lou Vasillo, of course, has been here 15 years, one of the most respected head coaches in all of football, and sure. 97, 46, and two. In his last three years, he's 28 and three. And of course, uh, an excellent staff, headed by Eddie Heffernan, a defensive uh, coordinator, linebacker coach. Rich Stratton, offensive line. Joe Papp, receivers. Charlie Ryder, offensive line. Chip Peterson, defensive line and special teams. Freshman coaches, Tom Ramsey, Ralph Bigger, Tom Malik. On the other side of the ball, the Pinelands coaching staff, Bill Bruno in his third year as head coach. Glenn Demarius is the defensive coordinator. Sean Ludoff, who's doing an outstanding job as their offensive coordinator. Vin Battigliara is their special teams. Pete Fabian, their linebackers. Bob Flanagan and Brian Shields. Steve Salento, their freshman coaches. Well, I guess Louis Versillo figures he has the Pylons defense right where he wants it. Third and goal and long. It's a third and goal at about the 12-yard line. The back split on this one. You see a back to the flat to the open side. Mark Glosky under heavy pressure is sacked. Russ Salento broke in. I think it was Mattern that finished him off. And Al Lacey's going to be forced uh, with fourth and goal again. And I think this time Lacey is going to go for three. Last time they were so far out of range that all they could do was say, what the heck, we'll throw a touchdown pass. But now Jason Dunn has entered the game, the sophomore kicker, and his range will be tested here. This will be about a 34-yard attempt. Well, I'll tell you, he's had some great kickoffs today. A couple of good boots. I think he potentially he can make this. Glosky is the holder from the right hash mark. Dunn for the lead. It has the distance. It is good. 
got a nice foot for a sophomore, this kid. That, uh, that's not the uh, first field goal in the history of Lacey Township. Uh, a field goal was kicked to win a state championship game a few years ago. I think, George, you did that game. What a great game that was. It was a big tight end that played for them. So Lacey has had it twice, and the Lions have scored twice. Five minutes, 17 seconds left before halftime. It is Lacey 11 and Pinelands 8. You just saw Rich Stratton on the sideline encouraging his, uh, his football players to keep it up because they're doing a great job, particularly on the offensive line of scrimmage. Penalties are already have been a big part of this game, and I get the feeling it may be that way the rest of the day because each offense seems to have the ability to pick up 10 yards and three plays with their, their different running games. Pinelands got in trouble on its second possession when a, a holding penalty made it second and long, or, and then a, I think it got to third down, and overhaul threw one away. Well, both offenses have been very, very steady between the 30s. Then all of a sudden you get in the 30 and, and some things change. The defensive alignment changes. Uh, the whole mental outlook changes because they're in a different defense and you've got to change your blocking assignments. So things do happen and penalties follow occasionally. Ted Brown lines up on the far sideline. He had the run back last time. Vila and Amato both back there as well. And this one comes to Vila at his six. Into the pile. And uh, not going down easily, is he? Jim Vila to the 30-yard line where Pylon starts his possession. Well, Jim Vila is quite a football player. He, uh, he ranks uh, number seven in the county. He uh, averages uh, over seven yards a carry. He, as we mentioned at the top of the show, has scored nine touchdowns already. He's only a junior. Um, he'll be certainly uh, you know, well sought after eventually as a potential uh, Division II or Division III football player. His running mate, who he compliments very well, Steve Amato, is a, is a fantastic athlete as well. So both of them really blessed this Pinelands team. Well, Vila got the season off on the right foot, scoring four touchdowns against Matter Day. And then Amato had four touchdowns the next week against Manchester. That was Amato, but that was no game. Well, you know, the game that, that we did with Pinelands Manchester, you didn't see a swarming defense like you see here at, at Lacey. And I don't think they saw that in their first four games. So it's a question of, of being able to overcome and, and not so much bounce to the outside, but get as much as you can up inside and possibly cut back because the pursuit of Lacey on defense is, is right now at its top form. And I think the cutback is there rather than bouncing to the outside. Second down and 10, Kochik is to the left, Colin Brown to the right. Two wide receivers in the game, out of the eye. Here's Vila, and Vila kind of skips over tacklers and blockers, and he got about five yards. You know, Ron, I think you mentioned it a few minutes ago. Amato looks hurt to me. He looks like he's, his, his leg is sore. He's got a little bit of a limp to him. He doesn't seem to be as effective as he was earlier in the game. Well, you know, there, there are two different running styles, even though we said that both of the backs of Pinelands do are slashing kind of runners. They still, uh, I, I think Amato runs a little up, straight up and down, and sometimes you're susceptible to some thigh uh, injuries, and he may have got a little thigh injury. Look right now, he's limping a little bit. He's number 20, he's the tailback, something for you to watch for. He it did come out of the huddle very gingerly that time, third and five at the 36, and now he goes awfully slowly in motion to his right. Overholt keeping it, and Overholt stopped. Penalty flag is down. Matt Coffey made the, the tackle. And I don't know, uh, I think they're, they're calling the flag back. No, no, no penalty on the play, which is pretty good news for Lacey because Pylons will have to punt it away now. It's a big series now for the uh, Lacey offense. I mean, we're winding down to under three minutes when they get the football back. And uh, they would like to get into the end zone. Amato standing back at his 25 yard line. Kill Murray for Lacey, shielding his eyes from the sun, a high. Short kick, Kill Murray will get away from it, and it takes a good wildcat bounce. Still going, and that'll get down nearly to the 20-yard line. Two minutes, 53 seconds to go in the first half. Keep in mind the Lions have just one timeout left if they try to drive this one down again. It's 11-8, the Lions leading Pinelands. Yeah, I don't think they want to make a mistake in their end of the field and put Pinelands back into this game. They have the lead now. There's no reason to do something like that. And Coach Priscillo is very, very cognizant of the fact that the secondary of Pinelands is very, very experienced and moving the football very well. I think if he's gonna put the football up, he's gonna be very careful of the type of play that he calls. Right now, he may be concerned with 
just getting that ball and, and getting into the line of scrimmage that he's he's had so much success with right now. You may not see the ball in the air, but you can't tell with Coach Priscilla because he's such a, a great offensive mind and does so many things to confuse the defense. 21, Bob Kittrick has checked into the Pylons uh, lineup. He's at a linebacker position. Well, Mike Foy came across, but he may have been reacting to a lacy offensive lineman. We'll see. Yeah, they, nope. went, they went to a long count, Rich. Drew them on sides. You know, usually at this time of the season, when you're into the fifth week of the season, you don't see too much of that because they're used to uh, uh, varied cadences. Uh, you're used to watching the football, and you're, you're, everything is on sight. Sound doesn't affect you. And I think a lot of coaches, uh, when they have their conditioning, they emphasize drills that include sight and sound and try to emphasize on the defensive football players just to think sight rather than worry about the sound of the cadence. 2.12 to go in the first half. It's a first down at 5 of the 17. Quick pitch versus Salas. A Salas, strong running, and he has a lacy first down outside the 35-yard line. And now we will take our own two-minute warning. 2.04 to go in the half. It is Lacey 11, Pylons 8, back with the rest of the first half right after this. room and Sasalo with another big run at the Pylons territory. He went for about 15 on that one. Plenty of time on the clock, still a minute 30 to go, and Lacey has moved it down, and now they don't have to worry nearly as much about a mistake. You know, I think if they go another 15 yards, then maybe they'll start to think about trying to put some points on the board, but right now, they'll probably try to run the clock down a little bit. If they can break away, fine. Well, we know they've got a field goal kicker, so they've just got to get that ball just around the 15 or 20 yard line and they can line themselves up and get three. I would think at this point into Pilots territory and down to 70 seconds to go that you'd want to hurry up a little more because now it's far more likely that you'll get a scoring opportunity than the other way around. It's a different when you're at your own 20 and now Barglowski will throw to the far sideline. Brewer has it and then lost it and they rule it incomplete. He had it for a moment and took a very hard hit and they call the pass incomplete. That's another example of the well-schooled defensive secondary of Pinelands. They move the ball very well. If they don't get there and knock it down, they're right there to make the tackle. Curious to see if he had possession of that, perhaps, and then might have fumbled out of bounds, which would have been fine for Lacey. But obviously, the official on the far side said no possession. Well, right, you know, right now, it doesn't look like uh, Coach Vercillo is interested in his two-minute drill to get himself down into, into uh, scoring territory. Uh, he's not running, uh, you know, uh, up to the line of scrimmage as quickly as some coaches might in this situation. But again, you don't want to throw an interception. You want to make a mistake. 57 seconds to go in the half, second and 10. Salento in again, and he makes the sack. Second time in the half that Russ Salento, number 69, has broken free at a drop for Glosky by himself. George, I don't know whether you found this when you were coaching, but I found that the longer I was in, in coaching, the more I played to our defense, and the more I got the feeling that, you know, rather than, than put us in a disadvantage and maybe going at half down by a score, rather than attempting to break the tie with us getting a score, I would rather just play close to the vest and go in 8-8. I don't know about you, but that's the way I have felt. Absolutely. Well, now 13 seconds in the half. Let's see if Borglossi just throws one down the field. He does for Kill Murray, and it's over his head and incomplete. And now the Lions have a choice with eight seconds to go on fourth and long. They could punt or take another shot, really, and throw one down the field again because uh, it figures to be the last play of, of the first half anyhow. What would you do here? Ron, would you, would you take another shot and see if you could maybe even hand the ball off, try to go 55 yards? Well, you're going to run eight seconds off the clock when you snap it. Yep. Uh, you know, I'd, but again, you, you throw the ball downfield and it's intercepted. It's the other team's ball, whether there's time on the clock or not, to run a score back. So uh, I think he'll probably decide to, to throw the ball downfield. Or he may just take the ball and run the ball and say, hey, let's go in at halftime, 8-8. Eight, eight. Maybe a quick opener. Pretty tight formation, Kilmore, a wing on the right, Cone out there on the left. And Barglowski looking uh, to find room, but can he find 55 yards worth, the question, and not that time, as Jim Vila stops him, and time expires in this first half. The battle for first in Class B South has lived up to expectations. Pylons uh, got on the board first, taking the opening kickoff. Yeah, well, they took the ball from their own seven-yard line, and uh, they went 93 yards with the, with the last play of the drive. 
uh, being a halfback option pass from Amato to, uh, to Ted Brown. And then they went for two and made it. And that was the fake. And they lined up to kick the extra point. And then it was Overholt hitting Kochuk for two more. Lacey came back, and on a fourth and very long play, Barglaski hit Kilmurray. In the second quarter, Bar Barglaski hit Mike Kilmurray at 42 yards, and then they went for two points from uh, stopping the ball in the line of scrimmage, and they made it, and made it 8-8. Eight, eight. And then, of course, Jason Dunn's uh, approximately 33-yard field goal to put them up 11-8. So that is where we stand with 24 minutes of football remaining from Lacey Township this afternoon at the half. It is Lacey 11, Pylons 8. We will be back with second half action after this. This message from President Bush and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Here's one of nature's most awe-inspiring sights sky filled with thousands of migrating ducks and geese so that Americans will always be able to enjoy this great spectacle by duck stamps because for more than 50 years federal duck stamps have generated the money to set aside more than four million acres of marshes swamps and coastal estuaries they provided places for these great birds to nest feed and rest during their annual journey America's migratory waterfowl are some of our most beloved wildlife. You can help ensure that our waterfowl will have a home. To find out more, write Duck Stamp, Washington, D.C., 20240 for a free brochure. Let's help preserve our precious wildlife. Stogling back here at Lacey with George Jack and Ron Ember and some very big halftime news. A disturbing development for Pylons. Their star tailback, Steve Amato, we thought maybe he got hurt in that second quarter. He apparently has some sort of shoulder injury. He will not return for the Wildcats today. Butch Sands, number 22, uh, is a reserve tailback. Played as a sophomore, was injured all of last year. This year has just seen sort of spot duty for the Pinelands uh, football team. Right now he's on the kickoff team. Maybe he will be the tailback. We'll have to wait and see. Lacey will start with the football on the first possession of this second half. Jeff Brewer grabs a line drive and brings it back the other way, and he is smashed outside the 30-yard line. The Lions lead this ball game 11-8, and they go to work from right to left here in the second half. And uh, Rich Borglowski, their quarterback, had a very strong first half. He really did. He, uh, he looks as if he has really come to, into his own. Uh, he, he ran the ball well. He threw exceptionally well. His ball handling has improved. And I think right now he's starting to do the things that his coaching staff had thought he would do at the very beginning of the season. The Lions from uh, just outside their own 31-yard line to Trill and Sasala in the backfield. Here's Sasala, and there's that cutback that you've talked about uh, so much, and Sasala got about five. Yeah, they, they, well, finally, this does a nice job cutting down the gaps and playing gap control defense. And as Ronnie said before, you have to try and find that crease and go opposite of where they're trying to control. Lacey's offense showed good diversity in the first half, running the ball and then hitting some big passes from Barkowski, picking up where they had to. They scored two of the three times they had the ball, and the third time... Lacey had the ball. Really, the clock became uh, its greatest enemy. Things might have turned out differently if not uh, for time running out. Second down, about five of the 36. Here's that counter tray, and uh, Sasala behind the right side of the offensive line picks up a first down. They run that play very well. They get a nice lead trap, and they cut up a hole up in the hole with the lead blocker. That's second or third time today. They get good yardage out of it. It'll be interesting as the game uh, gets into the uh, late parts of the third quarter and fourth quarter whether or not both teams since they have so many two-way players will start to wear down a little bit now uh, obviously both defenses are on the field an awful long time uh, we'll have to wait and see whether or not that's a, a factor for the big lineman and don't discount the loss of Steve Amato to Pylon's defense as well he's an important guy a rover back there picks off some passes and they'll have to go without him on uh, first down a run right up the middle and it was Cottrell who picked up three. There's Mike Foy, the uh, nose tackle. 
for Pylons, and it seems like Pylons now trying to put more guys right up on that line of scrimmage to try to contain this running attack. Well, usually on third and short uh, situations where they know the team is going to run the football, you'll find they'll have uh, uh, seven and eight man fronts. Uh, normally in, in their defense, you'll find that they have a man pretty deep in the secondary. He's at least 10 to 12 yards deep, and he's the guy who's sort of the center fielder. Lacey did not have a first down on the last play. They picked it up there. And Keith Bullets, not a happy camper here, but his opposite number, Mike Foy, just ran right into him. And Keith, Keith says, I'm trying to snap the ball. I've got my own problems to worry about. The last thing I need is this guy hitting me when I'm not yep, ready. The only time that's really a problem is at the end of the game when the team is trying to run the clock out and you get somebody teeing off on you because they're frustrated the whole day. But I don't think that was intentional. And really, there's, there's really no excuse for the person playing over the center to, to have that problem because, I mean, he's got his eyes right on the football, on the hands. And uh, I know, George, you taught your defensive lineman the same as us. Uh, as you move further away from the football, you've got to read the hand of the, of the down uh, offensive lineman. When that moves, that's your key. But when that football is right in front of you, there's really no, uh, no reason to jump off sides. So now it's a first down and five. Ball out at about the Lacey 49-yard line. Cottrell hit by Salento, but he spins away again. Dave Cottrell into Pineland's territory. It'll be a second down and very short. That was Russ Salento who made the tackle, and it's a good thing. It was sort of a, sh a shoestring kind of tackle because just extra effort almost got Cottrell into the secondary. Now an official timeout, and I guess we could get a measurement here, although from our angle, it looks as if the ball is two to three feet short of a yard marker, uh, of the first down marker, that is, and uh, no measurement. I won't even speculate as to why the clock stopped there. Matty Hatcher, I think, had his helmet off, and the umpire just said, Stop the clock till he gets the helmet uh, strapped up. Okay. Steve Stoop coming in uh, for Lacey now as Kill Murray leaves. If you're inclined to gamble, here's a down and distance where you could take a shot. I think Russell will probably stay on the ground, though. He does. Second and one. Cottrell has a first down outside the 45, inside the 45 yard line. And Lacey taking it down against Pinelands again on the first drive of the second half, picking up where they left off in the first half. I think that was a situation where, you know, Lubricillo, like almost everyone else in the ballpark, realizes that second and short is an excellent down to sort of a freebie kind of situation where you fake the ball into the line of scrimmage, you throw the ball deep and take a chance. Maybe you get a score, maybe you don't, but you've still got third and fourth down. But he, I think he's under the impression right now he would like to make sure his offensive line and offensive unit realizes they can punch that ball and get first downs. On a first down to the Pylons, 43. Here's Sasala inside the 40, and he got about five, and the line is just... Four, five, six yards a clip on the ground. Yeah, it's a long halftime with the homecoming ceremonies out here, and I guess they went to the chalkboard and found a few things that they wanted to come out and try, and it looks like they're moving the ball down the field. Well, that time they pulled both guards, and uh, normally what they do there is they'll, they'll block down the play side. The first guard will kick out, the next guard will lead through, and the back will just pick his hole, and he did an excellent job doing that. So Sal is better and better each week doing that. This is a second down and five at the Wildcat 38, just three down linemen. Now uh, the linebackers all right up on the line of scrimmage, and uh, the defense works for Pinelands as Mike Davis stepped up and stopped Sasalo for no gain, and they made a late adjustment there and seemed to fool uh, the Lions offensively. Mike Davis is, a, is an excellent two-way player. He's the center on offense and, and does a great job at the nose guard on defense, and he's the strongest football player they have on their, on their uh, team. And he right now, he's, uh, he's got to make the big plays. He's their leader on defense, and he's got to help make those big plays. Possibly four down territory here for Lacey, but a third down and five at the 38-yard line of Pylons. 6.50 to go, third quarter. Lions 11, Wildcats 8, slot right formation. Here comes Cohen in motion towards you. And a long count, and that may be too much time, although one of the Pilots players did uh, take a move from the outside linebacker position, and he did come across. Yep. Now, in uh, college or pros, that's okay. You can get into the neutral zone and bounce back, but not in high school ball, and that may be a donated first down. I think you're right. I, I, if you noticed uh, when uh, Pine Lance lined up defensively, uh, number 76, Joe Princiati, was sort of back off the football. Uh, that's sort of a throwback to the old flex defense that uh, I think Brick used a little bit of, and, of course, on the, on the, uh, the pro level. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys made uh, that innovation, but it gives the defensive lineman a little bit more chance to see things happen, and they can slide along that line of scrimmage a little bit better. Corey Matturn was the uh, Pinelands player that stepped offside, number 56. 
And that was a first down. Now at the 33-yard line, Sasala with everybody blocking in front. And again, plenty of room for Gary Sasala, who picked up nearly eight yards. Like you mentioned a moment ago, Ron, they got the guards out there. The fullback leads through, and there's plenty of blockers. And, uh, and at that time, Sasala uh, went about five yards before there was a white shirt near him. That's the only, the only thing that differs from that play to most tosses is a lot of teams will bring their quarterback as another blocker in front. Uh, that's not in, in uh, Lou Brasillo's uh, offensive thinking, but he does have everybody else out in front. He's got the guards and the lead back. That time Eric Jacobson threw a key block. Second down and a couple at the 25-yard line. There goes Brewer to the right. Penalty flag is down. Maybe some motion in the backfield. They tried a, a cross block. It didn't work. Control was piled up. And they're starting to make a couple uh, defensive adjustments. They're bringing some linebackers across the line of scrimmage. They're starting to fill some gaps that, that uh, are uh, natural gaps created by the, the defensive set. And it's, uh, it, right now it's confusing the blocking assignments for Lacey. And that's got to be corrected before they can go back to their uh, original game plan of moving that football up, the, up and down the field on the ground. The penalty is against the Lions. And Bill Bruno will back them up five yards, back to the 30. He really had to take the penalty there because of the gain on first down. Didn't want to leave a third and short. So now it'll back up maybe about a second and seven or eight. Yeah, uh, just a good situation for the waggle or the, or the back to the flat pass. Now we haven't seen Bargloski do much here in the second half. He's been content to hand it off and let his offensive line and his running backs get the job done. Well, they, uh, they've been doing that except for the penalties now that have bogged them down. This is reminiscent of the opening drive of the game for Pinelands when they controlled the clock for seven minutes and got on the board lead eight nothing, but that's uh, the last time the Wildcats have scored. It's 11-8 for Lacey. And it's another penalty flag. This will be motion again on Lacey, a screen for Kill Murray, and this is a penalty that Pinelands may not be interested in, but now a penalty flag comes down, and we could have offsetting penalties. Kill Murray had no game. But Patrick came in late and got him with the helmet, I think. Like Dan DeLucci, number 35, Rich. Yeah, he came flying in there late. You know, so many times you'll see that happen. Not only the two men in motion because of mixed communication, but you'll see an injury occur when someone has a late hit. Uh, I can distinctly remember when, when we played you, George, in a playoff game. Uh, there was a, a hit, a questionable hit after the whistle, and it was an injury as a result. And it's something that, you know, the emotion of the play gets someone to hit a little bit extra after the whistle, and the uh, result is a, is a injury. Here's the screen to Kilmary, with, which, of course, you can see the late hit come in from the backside. You couldn't get a look at the illegal shift. That occurred before Kilmary had got in motion. I don't think, you know what it was? It wasn't an illegal shift. What happened was you're allowed to move and adjust if you're a fringe player or a wideout, but you have to be set for a full second before the ball is snapped. As a result, they weren't. But they are going to mark off uh, that personal foul uh, against Delucia of Pylons, and that will be a first down. So it winds up working out for Lacey. It is a first down and 10 at the Wildcat 20-yard line. We're down to 4.50 to go in the third quarter as time drips away. Pylons hasn't seen the football yet in the second half, and when you think about it, that offense hasn't been on the field in about 40 to 45 minutes right. because you mentioned we had the long halftime, and Lacey had the ball at the end of the first half as well. On first down, Sasala, same play, and again, success. As Sasala gets to the 15-yard line, Colin Brown, and on the tackle with Brian Nuss. Nice job by Jeff, uh, Jeff Brewer, number one. Nice kick out block on number 40 for Pineland, Jim Villa. Sasala, only a sophomore, 5'9", 170, and uh, you mentioned the first half, he was thought to be the backup tailback coming into the season. Brian Elias, Keith's little brother, who's having all that success at Princeton this year, was to fill that role, but Keith got hurt right before the season started. A knee injury that has probably forced him out for the season, but Sasala doing a nice job in his stead. Second down and five. This is Sasala again, again a strong cutback, and Sasala is in the end zone. Nice job by Cottrell, springing the sophomore loose, too. They complement themselves, uh, each other, as well as Amato and uh, Villa do for Pinelands. And that time was a great block, great offensive surge by the line. And Sasala, good effort into the end zone. A drive that used up eight minutes and 12 seconds of this fourth quarter. Gary Sasala 
finishes it off on a 15-yard touchdown run. Low snap handled nicely by Barkowski there, and Dunn connects on the extra point. So with 3.48 to go in the third quarter, Lacey has taken an 18-8 lead. Gary Sasala, the guy, finishing it off. Okay, here you see the man in motion. You'll see a down block, kick out block by Cottrell and Sasala into the end zone and really only hit and contacted in the secondary by the three-yard line effort into the end zone. What I noticed on that play was the nose tackle Foy getting in the backfield, but then his vacated spot was where Sasala was able to run. Does the nose tackle just want to keep his position there and, and uh, sort of what the, what the Giants talk about sometimes is two gapping, well, well, not allowing a space? The nose tackle is offset, and what he does, he takes the gap. That's what his rule is, and he just happened to take the gap, and they just ran away from him. Chris Campo and uh, Keith Bullets did a great job up front there. So now this Pinelands offense has a task of overcoming a 10-point deficit without one of its best players. Steve Amato injured his shoulder. He is done for the rest of the day. And it will be on Joshua Overholt, the sophomore quarterback who has never been in this position, down in the second half and, and perhaps having to put it up to get the team back in it. But there's still plenty of time left, 3.48 to go in the third. Dunn has it teed at the 40. Both Browns are back with Vila. But it bounces to Kochek, who was able to field at his own 30 and go right up the middle. And good field position for Pylons. It'll start just shy of its own 40-yard line. It's going to be interesting to see what the Pinelands offense uh, does to try and move the football without their star running back. Jim August is the fullback, uh, number 39. And this is and interesting. Villa is the tailback. Shifted Jim Vila back to the tailbox spot, so we'll see how Vila does running out of that hole. He takes this play, and he won't get anywhere that time. Stopped right at the line of scrimmage. Dave Lobdell, who was switched from an end to an inside linebacker, and the switch has worked, according to Lou Versillo. Uh, you know, talking to the defensive coaches for Lacey, I, I'm, I'm sure, George, in your conversations, you caught the same inference that they really missed the linebackers they had last year more than they thought, and it took them this long to get the adjustments, the personnel adjustments, and the, just the general movements and mechanics back to a point where they had some, some real confidence in their linebackers. And I think the movement of uh, Lobdell back there, and of course, with Cottrell, give you two good linebackers. They go with three down linemen in there, Jacobson, Compagna, and Bullets. They've done a good job lately. And it's Vila, again, he nearly collided with Overholt and then took it up the field, and he got back about six yards. Yeah, the timing is not going to be there because he hasn't played tailback that much, probably. So you're going to see that kind of a miss, almost miss handoff and those kinds of things. This was a very interesting decision by Bill Bruno because obviously you're missing a, a cog and something's got to be done, but he risks effectively taking away both of his strengths. The, fail, the fullback going to tailback, but now you don't have that guy used to what he's doing and you're missing your tailback. Be interesting to see how it works out. Well, I think he's saying I have to go to my best running back now that's left. You know, that's, that's what you have to do. August, the uh, junior fullback, 39, stays in there. Third and three at the 46. Overholt on the waggle, in trouble, looks to cut it. What a great move, but uh, it's gonna be about a yard shy of a first down. And we may see Pinelands go for it here. Campagna chased him across and got it. It is marked down at about the 47 or 48 yard line. And Overholt is leaving the field. And Pinelands apparently will punt. It'd be interesting to see who the punter's going to be also because uh, the, uh, Amato was the uh, was the punter. And this is Jason Gomez, number 81, standing at his 30-yard line. And I mean, look kind of deep to me. <laughs> well, you know, when you lose, you don't just lose a tailback when you lose Steve Amato. You, you, you lose a defensive back. You lose your punter. You lose somebody who just uh, does so many things for you. And I'm sure, just as you mentioned, uh, George, he takes his best tailback or his best runner and puts him back in the tail of the eye because you can find a fullback to block. And, George, I think that is why Pylons had to use a timeout there because Gomez came out there and was 18 yards behind the line of scrimmage. At least, yeah. The line of scrimmage is about the 48-yard line, and Gomez lined up at his 30, and uh, the coaching staff for Pylons says, wait a minute, 
bad enough we've got a new punter, but let's not have the, the snapper thrown off as well. I would think you'd have to go for it here. I know the ball's only at midfield, but there's just a minute 15 to go in the third quarter. You're already trailing by 10. Lacey has shown this ball control offense where not only have they scored, but they've taken time off the clock, and it's only fourth and a yard, yard and a half. Well, it is, but you understand also that uh, you, we're st we've still got a lot of football time left if they weren't to make it, take the negative part of that. And now Lacey has the football on the other side of the 50 in your territory, and they're going to score again. Now you've got to have three scores instead of two scores to get yourself back into the game. So I think, uh, you know, just looking at the the... the the law of averages, it, it might be better to kick it. But again, you've got an experienced kicker. They may decide to go. Another factor, too, is that you haven't punted with this guy this season. And now they come out, and they will go for it. So after the timeout, Bill Bruno changes the mind. And Pylan's going for a fourth down. It's only about a yard. Backs in the eye. Coach checks a wing on the right. Two tight ends. It's Vila. And he has the first down. You're right, Rich. They went for it. <laughs> I think the thing of it is, in high school football, with 12-minute quarters and a ground attack, I think you may only be looking at two more possessions after this, no matter what happens. Yeah, depending on mistakes or fumbles, miscues, those kinds of things. I think the play selection was was good. I think everything was sort of pretty, you know, bottled up from tackle to tackle. Going outside and giving that good, that good running ability of Jim Vila a chance to work for you, it was a good offensive call as far as the play itself was concerned. Lions leading the game 18 to 8. 45 seconds to go, third quarter. First down in Lacey territory. Overholt, straight back to throw. Cannot avoid the rush. John Campagna, the senior nose tackle, makes the sack. I was very impressed with John Campagna against Rick Memorial, the first ball game. He's real quick off the line of scrimmage. We haven't seen too much first down passing from Lacey, or rather from Pylon, so you might have had a reason to think it would have fooled the line defense, but Compagna got in there anyhow. The clock ticking down, 3-2, and it doesn't look as if Pylons will get off another play in this third quarter. The clock is now at zero, and now we do get the whistles on the field. And that will be the end of the third quarter, I believe. Yes, it will. Again, the Lacey ball control doing the job. The Lions taking the opening kickoff of the second half and control the ball nearly eight minutes of that third quarter. The drive culminating on a 15-yard touchdown run by the tailback Gary Sasala and the Lions in a commanding position with 12 minutes to go in the game. We're back for the fourth quarter after three. Lacey, 18, Highlands, 8. It entered our homes 50 years ago. It was television. Then came cable. And the good idea got even better. A few channels became dozens. Well, here I am again with a chance. Satellite technology wired us to the world with 24-hour movies, news, sports, and music. Hello, cable system. I'd like to order the fight, please. Innovations that will come together in 1992. To compliment NBC's network coverage. The Olympics triple cast. Three separate cable channels. In addition to the NBC network broadcast. Commercial free. All the best events. 15 days. 24 hours a day. The Olympics triple cast. Another cable triumph. We're back at Lacey, fourth quarter. Pilots down by 10. It could be a very important drive, but they'll start second and long after the first down sack, something the Pilots offense is not built really to deal with. Yeah, I think right, right now it's, it's a big series on both sides of the football. Uh, it's the beginning of a new quarter. You've only got eight minutes of football left. We'll have to see what happens. Second down of 18. Pilots in its own territory at 47. They run a little scissors handoff from the wing, but it did not pull the lines. Scissors, I like that. Yeah, that's what it was. People have called it all kinds of things, but scissors, yeah, that's it. <laughs> As 
a former coach, why don't you try to explain what I was talking about? Well, that's why the wing back, when the wing back comes back inside on a counter after you fake to, to one of the backs who fills for a tackle, who pulls and traps. Call it whatever you want, you can certainly call it third and long. It is third and 17 at about the 48 yard line. Alan Vogel was in there momentarily. He's back out of the game now. August and Vila the backfield. Ted Brown flanked out to the right. Overhaul looking, firing, and it's knocked away and picked on. Gil Murphy got his hands on it. And I believe it's Altman that comes up with it and returns it to midfield. Big play, big defensive play. Linebackers weren't fooled, it was off action. Jim August made a nice fake up inside, fooling everybody except, of course, the linebackers who were keying that tight end. We'll get a look, I think it was Tom Nolan actually, 40 seconds. Here you see the fake inside, and the throw to the tight end. Actually, it was to Kochik, the, the wing back, and then the pickoff, and it's now Lacey's football. It is Nolan. One of the linebackers who made the interception. And you see after Kilmurray got a piece of it, Nolan nearly dropped it. Had it for a moment, bobbled it, and scooped it up before it hit the turf. So the Lions, leading by 10, have the ball at midfield. All sorts of movement, and certainly a defensive lineman, I think Princiati came across. This is the type of thing that cost Lacey in its first two weeks of the season, over-anxious. In fact, uh, Lou Brasillo said, well, the kids say they're aggressive, but uh, aggressive doesn't become the stupid. You have to play smart. Right. You know, and, and discipline. Now, we use the word discipline in coaching, Rich. You have to be disciplined enough to stay there until legally, until the ball is snapped and you're legally able to penetrate because they're using a staggered count now. He's probably using an inflection in his voice, Sparklowski, and he's, and he's pulling the Pineland defense offside for an easy five yards. That's at least the third time the Wildcats have come across the line prematurely today. First and five now at the 46. In the backfield, it's Sasala. They ran a little bit of misdirection there off the counter, but Sasala only got about a yard. Teams come in tied for first in Class B South. The Lions lost their first two out-of-conference games this year, but they bounced back with two solid wins. For Pylons, it's a perfect 4-0 record on the line today. Both 2-0 in Class B South. Central, a loser this weekend. So Central, who came into the weekend also undefeated, now has one loss. It'll be Central at Pylons next week. And if Lacey holds on, that'll be a, a battle for second place. So Salah picked up uh, about three more. That was Mike Davis, linebacker Mike Davis, who made that play. There you see the uh, defensive huddle. Mike Davis calling the plays, getting the defensive uh, signals from the sideline. There you have Rich Barlowski, who's getting the uh, play in from uh, Kilmurray from the sideline. Uh, so you get both the offensive and defensive signals sent in from the sideline, usually either uh, verbally or some kind of hand signal. Third down and a long yard at the Pylons 42. Here's Sasala again, and I think he got it, diving out to the 40-yard line. It may be close, but it's going to be awful that, uh, close. Has enough. It's going to be awful close. I think the play before this one, Cottrell told Sasala, "Look, when I turn a guy inside, you bounce it outside." The kid, the sophomore kid, ran up inside when Cottrell was trying to, trying to turn him down to the inside. This time, he kicked him out and he went up inside of it. You know, it doesn't doesn't matter how much you practice that either. You know, you 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 uh, drill things against bags or against people, and you show people exactly what they're going to do. They're going to kick out. You're going to run up inside. But in the heat of battle, that back is going to take it where he thinks he can go. Sometimes they'll make a mistake. Sometimes they'll guess right. Sometimes they'll run it the way the play is designed. But uh, most of the time, the way that's drawn up on paper isn't always the way it happens in the game. As you could see, it is about as close to being a first down as can be without being a first down. It's a link of a chain on fourth down here, and I am certain that Lou Versil will, will keep it uh, on the ground here. Yeah, when you're up 10 points, you can go for it here. Fourth down on an inch at the 41. Do you think he'll hand off or Barklowski just to dive behind bullets? Uh, I, I would have Barklowski take the football and not risk a handoff, but who knows? He does hand off. 
could be an interesting spot, but it looks as if Lacey got it. Control went forward. First and down. And they give him the forward progress of the 40 and a yep. line first down. And that clock will keep moving. As they love it here in Lacey, eight and a half to go in the ball game. 18 to eight for the Lions, keeping it on the ground. Interesting transition. And you made reference to it, uh, Cottrell talking to the sophomore Sasala, instructing him at the beginning of the season, Cottrell was the guy who carried the ball right. four or five times uh, more than Sasala did, even out of that fullback spot, but with the emergence of the sophomore Sasala, now Cottrell being used more to block. Well, and he's also a middle linebacker. Let's not forget that. He's one of the team leaders here. It's Sasala again, bouncing off a hit, maybe taking another, and rolling out for five. First down run, and you pick up a, a good enough game to be in a position where you can run what you want. That's been the story of the game offensively for Lacey against the Pylons defense. There you see the sideline. There's Coach Lou Versillo sending his play in. Coach Versillo has had an awful lot of experience, particularly in the offensive side of the football. He's, he's coached not only in four or five all-star games in the county, but he's, uh, he's also coached in the state game up in uh, Rutgers, and he's handled the offensive in all those situations, and, and I think uh, pretty much has a, a good grasp of what can work against certain defenses. Second down and about five of the 35. Play action, Borklaski's going deep. Kill Murray's out there. Touchdown! You talk about a good grasp. Well, they lull you to sleep, you know. You forget about it, and like it happened before, and all of a sudden, bingo, he's gone. What a nice touch on the ball, too, George. The kid threw the ball just uh, perfectly. The, the first one to, to uh, kill Murray in this one. So much for running out that clock, a 10-point lead, controlling the ball. Lacey perhaps drives the uh, final nail into the pylons coffin on a long touchdown play. Done at the extra point. What a, actually, uh, he hooked it wide. Looked like he hit it. But he actually hooked it wide. Second half's been all Lacey. 7-14 on the clock. Lions 24, Wildcats 8. Okay, here's the replay. Fake up inside the throw, and he just got it off just in time. Wide open. Defensive back, fit the fake. He was five yards in the open. It was a great call by Coach Priscilla and the offensive coaches. Ron, you, you work with a lot of quarterbacks, and one thing everybody talks about is how well does a quarterback stand in and release the ball when he knows he's going to get hit. And I thought Borglowski did an excellent uh, job there. He had two defenders in his face and didn't back off at all. That's the hardest thing to teach someone. In fact, sometimes you can't teach it. You, you, you drill it and you hope that early in a quarterback's career he doesn't get shelled to a point where he gets quote-unquote shell-shocked and, and is a little bit shy. Uh, obviously, the drills that Coach Priscillo and the people who work with the quarterback use have given him this ability to stand in because that time he had somebody right in his face, stood, delivered the ball, perfect pass, good action on the ball, ran under it, Kill Murray, touchdown. Where can you see the difference in Mark Lasky early in the season to what we have seen today? Oh, uh, absolutely, no question about it. He's a lot more poised. All we need is the uh, tomahawk chop here at Lacey. As Highlands brings it out to the 30-yard line. Down below, the celebration's on for a big homecoming crowd. Lacey has re-established re its dominance in Class B South. I still like Minnesota. <laughs> you know, it's a very risky proposition making predictions when the tape of this will be shown well after the series has ended. <laughs> well, I think a week ago, Ken asked us to make a prediction. I picked Minnesota, <laughs> and I'm going to stick by it. You understand you can't win with this. Either you're wrong, or the Twins win game six and seven. Everyone says, well, sure, he edited that in on Monday morning. Big deal. <laughs> First down, they were in the draw. And Vila stopped for no gain, and he has not yet uh, found the feel of the, the tailback spot. Well, right now, Lacey's in a great position because they know with 629 and counting that Pineland has to put the ball in the air. 
Finally, it doesn't really have a drop back package in their game. They're mostly a pass off action once they get that run established. Well, right now they've got to throw the ball. The throw off action in passing situations really doesn't give you much of an advantage. So right now, the defensive line can tee off, get to the passer, and the defense can play pass. For what it's worth, we didn't make much of that missed extra point. But it allows the deficit to be 16, not 17. So Pinelands, with two touchdowns and two two-point conversions, could tie the game on two scores. Otherwise, they would have needed three. Overhaul misses Vila on that one. And now Pinelands will be looking for third and long. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it does uh, uh, give Pinelands a little bit of a shot. But again, if you look at what they've done so far in this half without Steve Amato, uh, their chance of getting in the end zone one time, let alone twice, right now will be quite a chore. Down to 5.51 on the clock, and on third and 10, Overholt, again, will uh, need to rely on some good protection right here and trying to find a receiver and keep Pylons and drive alive. And you'd have to also think no more punts for the Wildcats. You've got to think in terms of four downs. Third and 10. Line, defensive line shifting, and Overholt stepping to his right for Kochak, who leaps and grabs it. And Joe Kochik with a first down nearly out to midfield. There's the size of that big wide receiver. Yeah, he's a tough kid. You can see where he, after he caught that football, he put his shoulder down. He was going to run over someone. Kochik is a transfer from Kansas. That's uh, one of their two transfers. And, and he's a big flanker and a real good defensive end. He really does a nice job for him, both sides of the football. And that time, just as George mentioned, he decided he was going to be a runner after he caught the ball and gained some extra yards. Wildcats keep it alive. First down at the 48-yard line. And we will see if Overholt keeps it in the air. Well, he keeps the ball running to his left. Two lines in front of him, and Overholt in trouble. He just kind of pulled up. And Tom Altman, number 37, a senior safety, pulled him down. One thing I think they, they have seen in this Lacey team is a, a distinct speed difference between the other teams that they've played. Uh, Manchester, of course, had speed, but they had it in the offensive backfield. Right now, Lacey has a lot of speed on their flanks, on their corners, and they can make that pursuit. Normally, Overhaul would have been able to take the corner and got up and got some extra uh, plus yardage, but not with the people that they have playing linebacker and outside backer and defensive secondary for Lacey. Think back to the opening drive of the game where Pylons kept the Lacey defense very off balance. Went down and picked up eight quick ones, but that's been the uh, gross output today. And a pass into coverage there by Overhaul and nearly was interception number three, but it falls incomplete. That was intended for Matt Hatcher. Matt Hatcher is a merit scholar. He's, a, he's just an outstanding young man, not only on the field, but off the field and in the classroom. And uh, he, he does a great job at defensive end catching the football, and that time he almost was able to catch him, just a deflection, or he could have had some running room. Seems to be a direct proportion between Lacey's success on the football field and the uh, volume and frequency of the music up here, and uh, now the celebration is on all over the place. Well, when the other team has the ball, you always tell your band director, <laughs> start playing and make it loud. But when we have it, don't play at all. Be quiet. I've never seen a quarterback actually come to the line of scrimmage and try to quiet down the band. Overholt uh, looks to be setting up a screen. Instead, throws it deep for Kochik, and it's over his head. And incomplete. Deep drop back that time by Joshua Overholt. Trying to have that uh, Midwestern connection again. Overholt, transfer from Indiana, and as you mentioned, Kochik from Kansas. And he almost hit him, just put a little too much on it. Now I think we're going to find out whether or not the, we do have a punter, a second punter for Pinelands, because they're definitely in a punting situation right now. Well, why would you punt, though? It's at 423 to go in the game. Why not take a shot here? What do you have to lose? But they uh, do come out punting formation. But we mentioned you can still uh, tie this game. Things broke right with two touchdowns. Gomez fumbled the snap, and he has the punt blocked. Brett Bastano, number 28, got in and blocked it. Jason Gomez forced a punt due to the injury to Amato, and he did not handle the snap, and then it was in trouble. I think it was Lemonowitz, number 27. I think it was Doug Lemonowitz that blocked the punt, Rich. 
Well, we two have a chance, seven. Uh, Rich, if I get an opportunity, I'll mention the officials. Ray Pennant is the referee. Uh, Dick uh, Geisendaffer is the umpire. Charlie uh, Schrafer is the uh, linesman. And Joe Feeney is the back judge. Yeah, there again, we were talking about the punter, the regular punter being out. And here you go, the young kid drops the ball on the ground, and the punt is blocked. You guys both thought that a punt was called for there? I mean, you're, it's four minutes to go in the game. You need two touchdowns to tie. Why uh, punt? You had three downs to move the ball and didn't do it, so. And uh, Lou Versillo now going to the razzle-dazzle. Trying a reverse, and that was John Cohn running it, but that will be called back due to the clips. Well, you know what he's doing now, don't you? Now he's giving the scouts in the stands something to write about, getting ready for next week. We used to love to do that. Emmett was great at that. <laughs> We don't run these plays uh, when it really counts, but we'll show you something to, oh, to practice. Yeah. Oh, Oh, absolutely. Week. Give them 15 or 20 minutes worth of practice time a day to defend something you're never going to use again. Of course, you don't want to get too nuts when the game's already won. Now, getting back to your comment on why would you punt the ball being down two scores with four minutes to go, a lot of times coaches will play percentages. They'll say, let's kick the football. Maybe they'll fumble the kick, return. Maybe they'll fumble in the first play. Maybe we'll play tough defense and get it back. Maybe we'll block a punt. Coaches play the percentages a lot of times, and maybe that percentage is better than going for a fourth and six or fourth and seven uh, when you haven't really moved the football on the ground in the second half. So Pylons will hope for a Lacey turnover. The ball moved back on the penalty to the Lacey 32-yard line. Clock running with three and a half to go in the game. 24-8, the Lions lead. And uh, we'll keep it simple this time. This is Sal. Stop at the 35-yard line by Princiati. You know, something I've noticed the whole game, and it's not only the running backs, but even the defenders, when they picked off a pass for Lacey, when they get in a the crowd, they have both arms wrapped around that football. They must work on that and work on it diligently because their kids are doing it and doing it well. Assuming the Lions hold on, they will take first place of Class B South. The schedule uh, next week for uh, Lacey is Point Borough, which is a little bit of a breather for Lacey. However, you never underestimate an Al Saner coach team. He's just a great motivator of young people. For Pinelands, they go right back into the fire. They have Central Regional next week. And uh, Central, of course, coming off this loss will really be after a win. And we will have that game uh, from Pinelands next week. So Salah got a couple more after Point Pleasant Borough for Lacey. The Lions come back here for a home game with Raritan, a non-league game. Then out Monmouth, and then a uh, schedule for Thanksgiving morning. Lacey will host Central. And that could be the one uh, in which the Lions are trying to wrap up this B South title. Bill Bruno at the beginning of the season thought that Lacey was the team to beat. This was four weeks ago, five weeks ago, and, and obviously that held true today. It's a third down and awfully, awfully long, about 24 yards. Lions taking as much time as they can, and now Lacey will call a timeout, but if you notice, they didn't call the timeout right away. Barglowski waited until the play clock was down. There's no visible play clock in high school, but he waited until as much time had expired as, as he could allow, and then calls for time with two minutes and a second remaining in the game. Lacey 24, Pine lands eight. And guys, I guess you would have to say that the Lions have answered a lot of questions today. Oh, yeah, but I still think, uh, and I'm sure we all agree, that Pinelands turned the corner. I mean, they have a legit football program now, and uh, it's going to take time. They have to get into the playoffs like these other teams and get a feel for it. Um, the Lacey Lions are an experienced uh, coaching, have a, an experienced coaching staff, and I think that that was a big difference today. You know, I, I don't think there was really any nervousness. I think there was a lot of excitement before this game, but I don't think either team was really nervous. Uh, we had some penalties early, but I think both teams really came into it understanding their abilities, uh, understanding the other team's weaknesses, and performed very, very well. It just happened to be a break here or there, and of course some, some very, very good offensive line blocking by uh, the Lacey team that got them to a point where they could now take the, uh, the run, throw the pass, and they were very successful on two good, long uh, passing plays, and they seem, seem to be the difference today. You gotta look at big Chris Campo having some uh, trouble with his helmet, and I think Chris is still <laughs> having some problem with the chin strap, and now uh, Bishop comes over and says, just take this off. 
You know what happens sometimes uh, in a situation? You lose a player for a play. What we always had was a helmet buddy on the sideline. And, uh, you know, someone on the sideline has the same size helmet, and all you do instead of losing a timeout or losing a player, you run over and say, uh, who's, who's Campo's buddy? And you don't have to go through this. One problem, though. How many 290-pound guys? Wait, who's going to be Campo's buddy on Lu this Lu team? Lou has a helmet that fits him. <laughs> They just made an announcement here that uh, Lou Vercillo, if they continue and win this ball game, it will be his 100th coaching victory in his career. Well, I think we should definitely have him on after the game. A nice milestone for Lou Vercillo and his Lions. And uh, there he is with that Notre Dame cap, the sunglasses. A Lou Holtz wannabe, you think? <laughs> Says he's just always liked Notre Dame, grew up rooting for the Irish. Wears the hat for luck, but he changes it every year. Isn't that interesting? Third down, they run the draw, and here is Cottrell. Nice move by Dave Cottrell, but he can't get enough because he is stumped to the ground at the 47-yard line, and now the Lions will punt it back. Well, he's, he's, he's got seven touchdowns himself. He played a couple games out of that tailback spot. He's a heck of a blocking back. He's done a nice job at middle linebacker calling the signals. He's had a nice ball game today. Uh, just in case you're interested in this continuing saga, they took a screwdriver to Campo's helmet down on the near sideline. And I think if Chris is needed, he may be ready to go now, but uh, still looking at the helmet quizzically, he's not sure. But it probably won't matter. They are waving goodbye to the Wildcats as Barglowski on to punt it away with a minute 30. And now the Lions took too much time. That was probably intentional. I don't think it was intentional, but they needed an extra blocker. Uh, Pinelands had uh, more people uh, coming in to try to block than they had blockers, so they had to move their wide, ma wide man in. And by the time they got set, the uh, seconds had expired. An awful lot of penalties, really, both ways today. Yeah, the quality of play was good. There was a lot of motion and offside things that both teams want to correct. Nice high punt. It's Ted Brown, spun around, staying on his feet, and now stopped. Well, you have Pinelands regrouping for one more shot. A minute and 22 left. And uh, I'm sure they're going to have to put the ball in the air, which again gives that uh, defensive front of Lacey an uh, opportunity to tee off and, and uh, get some sacks. Defensive secondary to read the football and, and Coach Bruno to go through an agonizing uh, minute of trying to get something that's going to work. And we want to thank our Channel 8 uh, overworked, underpublicized technical staff, Chris Arrhenia, Jeff Simons have been in the truck today, Mary Jen Beach and Tony and Tesso risking life and limb once again down on the sideline. Audrey DeWeiss, Ed Senior, Mike Philbin also are on cameras today. Pylons going back to the ground and Alan Vogel, number 45, and Mary Jen Beach down there with uh, Tony and Tesso. Not only is Mary Jen down there on the camera with Tony, but she also tries to protect Tony when the action comes his way. And, and due to Mary Jen's presence that we have Tony from week to week. You guys don't realize that, but I work with these people during the week and uh, always have to check the injury list. Tony, Tony usually questionable to doubtful, and then he always comes through on Saturday. <laughs> That's funny. You know, it's great that the coaches in the area cooperate with us and the cameras are allowed to be along the sidelines. Could be the final play of the game. At the 37-yard line, overhold throwing for Ted Brown, complete. Brown into the secondary, spun around. Clock shows no time left. And that is it. That's about it. A tight first half, but a lion ball game in the second half. Two scores, dominating defense. Pylons forced to play without Steve Amato, could not make up for his loss. And the Lions take over first place in Peace South. They win it 24 to 8. Guys, your, your thoughts on player of the game, George? <laughs> George wants Ron to do it first. Well, no, I mean, I think, uh, I thought, yeah, I thought he played a nice ball game. Um, I, thought, I thought Cottrell played a nice ball game. I know Kilmary caught a couple of nice passes and Barglowski threw the ball to him. But in the trenches, I, I kind of like 
Uh, Cottrell for myself. How about you, Ronnie? Uh, I like Dave Lobdell. I thought he had a great, uh, great game at uh, on defense. Uh, maybe a, a lineman and a, and a offensive back. It's up to you, uh, Rich. Lobdell or Cottrell? Huh? Well, I could go both ways. There are a number of other guys that good games here as well. Barklowski able to hit that big fourth down play and then throw a touchdown late. But I because of the way the, the line played on both sides, I'll, I'll pick one of the linemen and go with Dave Lovdell. Fair enough. Never would have thought 24-8 would have been the final, the way this one started. And we will recap the scoring and also be back with you as Lou Brasillo goes on the shoulders of his Lions players celebrating his 100th win. We will be back with all the post-game festivities. Final score, Lacey 24, Pylons 8. Stay with us. Dave uh, Lobdell with me, number 60, from the Lacey Lions after their victory today uh, against Pinelands, 24-8 in a big Class B South game. And Dave, uh, you told me before that you've been a middle linebacker for three games now. You did an outstanding job offensively and defensively, and that's why we've elected you player of the game. Tell me a little bit about being moved to linebacker. Whose idea was it? Do you like playing middle linebacker? Do you like playing with Davey Cottrell? Well, uh, it was Coach, uh, Coach Hefferton's idea to move me middle linebacker because he thought that uh, Matt Coffey, the defensive end, would uh, uh, benefit better to our defense if he was there and they put me in middle. So I just like agreed with him because, I mean, Coach Heff, he's great on defensive coordinator. So I went to middle and now that's just where I'm playing. It's fun. <laughs> How about playing with a guy like Dave Cutchell, who's so intense, a great blocker on offense and calls the signals on defense? Uh, Dave's Dave's great hard player. If, I mean, I wouldn't be doing half as good as I am now if it wasn't for Dave. I mean, he's brought me along well, and like he just helps me out so much on defense. So. I guess you know, being an offensive uh, lineman and then having a chance to play defensive linebacker and crunch other people must be uh, a rewarding experience for you. It is. I, I like I like the hitting part of the game very much. Uh, I, I was really happy when they put me in the middle for that reason, so I could just run and hit people, and that's basically what I like most about the game. You know, you look at records, and uh, of course, you, you opened up against two very tough football teams from the A Conference. Um, uh, Lacey now has taken sole possession of first place in the Class B Conference, and always has to be reckoned with. You have a fine coaching staff here. You have a lot of tradition at Lacey. Some great players who've gone through this school, and you've played with and have seen go on. Uh, what do you think about the future of the Lacey Lions this season? I think uh, we we should take our division. Because uh, with our coaching staff, they're just so great. Like Coach Stratton, our offensive line coach, he's phenomenal with the way what he does with us and the way he works with us. And like our entire offensive line, I think, I mean, if we can all stay healthy, we're just. I think we'll take our division. Yeah, we we uh, in Ocean County are rooting for you guys, and I know coaches tell you to take one game at a time. Uh, what about your grades in school? What kind of a student are you? Taking college prep courses? Uh, I'm about, I, know, I guess, a B average. Uh, I work pretty hard, but I mean, I suppose I could work a little harder, but, but uh, I'm about a B average. You have plans of going on to school someday? Yes, hopefully. Hopefully to play football, too, somewhere. Well, you're a fine young man, and uh, we're glad to award you a plaque you'll receive in a couple of weeks. We'll have it delivered to the school. You did a great job today, and continued good luck to you and your teammates. All right. Thank you very much. Coach Emmert. 
Thank you. I, I'm here with uh, Coach Priscillo. Uh, Coach, of course, is uh, not only celebrating his victory over Pinelands today, but also his 100th victory. Um, I know, Coach, you were at uh, Red Bank for a while and uh, had spent some time, I think, uh, doing some graduate work and some uh, coaching at Tarkio College. Um, maybe you can uh, reminisce a little bit for us uh, some of the great people you've coached with. Uh, maybe a little bit about your staff today and maybe a comment or two about how, uh, the importance of today's victory. Well, I've been fortunate to, to have worked uh, for some great people. I think uh, I actually started out in high school with Red Bank Catholic with uh, Tommy Lolly, who was a very uh, strong organizer, and he, he ran a, a good football program. And shortly thereafter, I moved over um, as an assistant for one year under Bobby Strangia, who, of course, at the time was... Uh, in the in the middle of the longest win, winning streak in the state of New Jersey, you know, and, and I was part of his program as a offensive coordinator, and we went 11 and 0 that year. That was one of the most cherishing years I, that I've ever had uh, experienced, and you know, I'll probably ever have. The uh, then after that, of course, I, I just took the reins and at Red Bank, and we were fortunate enough to be very successful there uh, prior to moving here. Now, since 1981, uh, you know, you've won two state championships. Uh, you've had uh, tremendous football players and you've established the, the team attitude which of course is the mark of a good coach and a, and a good program. Um, you seem to have an Ivy League connection, uh, quarterback and a running back and uh, I think there's a young man on this year's team who is an excellent academic uh, possibility and football player. Maybe you could mention something about those youngsters. Well, We're, we're very proud of those youngsters because so many times people would like to think or even say that football players aren't very bright you know and uh, we don't find that to be true because uh, we have quite a few kids that do excel in the classroom. Mike Kilmurray this year is still number one in his class, and it's uh, very possible he could go Ivy League. Last year, Garrett Gardy was um, in the top five anyway, and, and so was Keith Elias. You know, so for the past two years, we've had people go to the Ivy Leagues, and, and they're excelling both academically and athletically, so we're, we're proud of that. Well, I'd like to congratulate you on, on your victory today and, of course, the, the milestone that you passed and uh, um, hope your family holds up as you continue your coaching. It's always important to have a, a young woman behind you. And, of course, your wife, Lori, has uh, been a, a, a savior for you, and you need that support, and I'm, I'm sure you uh, will, will vouch for that. Um, I'd like to uh, also uh, comment on, on your facilities and, and what you've done, and, and I'm, I'm sure uh, John Gardy, the athletic director, and, and the the administration has certainly helped you here at Lacey. Sure, they have, and, and we continue to try to work towards perfecting the entire complex and, and working uh, towards the, uh, to making our program as class program should be. You know. Once again, thank you very much, and for uh, Ron Emmer, George Jack, and Rich Steigman, uh, we just saw Lacey Township uh, become victorious for their third one of the season, uh, an important step toward the playoffs for them and for a league championship, uh, and today it was uh, Lacey over Pinelands, and once again, uh, thank you and good night.